All right, buenas tardes, buenas tardes. Vamos a comenzar. <coughs> Por favor, no he hecho nada todavía. Gracias. All right, here we go, ready. Um, this is the lightning talk session on business engagement and innovation. I'll speak for a little bit, but this isn't about me. This is really about the following speakers, which are uh, Romina Ruiz Coiriena, Roque Planas, eh, Luis Ortiz Perez, who's on our way down, and uh, Felicita Sanchez. So you'll be hearing from them in a minute. But um, I'm going to try to set the stage for what you're going to hear from them. Uh, my name is Miguel Ferrer, and what you should maybe know about me is that I started in the music business. I am not a journalist. <clears throat> I worked in A&R. I helped discover some bands you may have heard of, at least uh, identify them for this market, Café Tacuba, Maná. This was a lot of fun working with them back in the day. Um, and then I got into marketing, and in marketing I discovered, not that I personally discovered it, but I learned about social networking and the power of the internet to connect people, and I fell in love with that. And so I became an entrepreneur in that space, and I should say, well, um, the slide says debt, what it should really say is hashtag fail. So I was a failed entrepreneur, but I learned a lot by failing. And so uh, in that learning, <clears throat> I was able to come back to work, uh, learn, uh, bring what I had learned in the digital space to, to media. Specifically at People Español, I ran, uh, I was involved in business development um, at AO Latino as the general manager as we went back into uh, AO, uh, Latin America. And then as we came back out of Latin America, as we failed at that as well. Um, then I went over to Huffington Post. I was the managing uh, editor for HuffPost Latino Voices, uh, HuffPost uh, Voces in Spanish, and HuffPost Black Voices. I was the first hire at Fusion. I ran digital for the first year and a half uh, there. And then in the last four years, I've really been a, a, a strategist, a consultant, if you will. But what I really wanted to focus on today is what I've learned while at AOL Latino, Huffington Post, and Fusion. So that's what I'll talk to you for a few minutes about. What you should know about AOL Latino, because it was a while ago, is that it was a very successful dial-up service provider. It made a lot of money, and that's inclusive in the, uh, the Hispanic uh, marketplace. And once we had that pipeline, well, we had to figure out what did we put into it. And so we, we defaulted into being content creators, essentially news providers. Um, <clears throat> but we missed the boat on everything going to broadband, which had made the company even more successful. And we also missed the boat, very importantly, on the idea that news became much more personality driven. If you think of the places that you like to go to nowadays to enjoy your news, either the brand itself or the person sharing that news matters to you more than it did in the past. And so that was a key learning that we missed out on. But we were good about other things. <clears throat> and those are the lessons I want to share. We were very good at understanding that people consume news as broadly as you want to define it because it delivers value to them, right? It's important to them. We also understood that entertainment is a tremendous magnet for advertising. If you offer entertaining product, content, whatever it is, there's advertising that wants to live side by side with it. And if you offer lifestyle, be it news or experiences or whatever, it, it brings people want to get involved in that more from a sponsorship perspective. So AOL as a whole and AOL Latino particularly, we're very good at making money off those three different things. But we were not great at building new things. We had deep enough pockets that we would acquire and essentially grow by acquisition, but we didn't know how to build the thing that was coming next. And so <clears throat> that led us to acquiring Huffington Post. Um, the thing about Huffington Post that it pioneered, and people forget, is that, although it was only 10 years ago, it feels like it was 100, is that it was personality driven. Ariana Huffington had an extraordinary personality. A, gravi a lot of people gravitated to her, and a lot of her key editors had great personalities, and people started listening to them as well. <clears throat> it was the first place that I remember that really boldly would mix highbrow and lowbrow. So next to having a Pulitzer Prize winning series about um, uh, war and uh, veterans' uh, issues and veterans' health, we'd have stories about Salma Hayek's boobs, right? And it worked. The same people who wanted to read about the, the, the Pulitzer Prize stuff would click on Salma Hayek's boobs as well. So that was a breakthrough. Uh, it was also the first place that really understood how to take advantage of, uh, you know, the, 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 what was possible with blogging as a more personal expression, a massive personal expression, and have that live side by side with journalism as well. <clears throat> and third, from a, uh, a technical perspective and from a capability perspective, it was very strong in search and social as well. Over time, other places like BuzzFeed particularly uh, outlapped Huffington Post in terms of social, but for a while it was really firing on all cylinders. Huffington Post also understood that you could, if you gave narrow audience groups a space for themselves to read about themselves or for them to produce 
stories for themselves that you could grow. And so it had all these channels. You may remember a few years ago, you'd go to Huffington Post and there was 50 channels. There was Impact, there was a channel for people who were 50 plus. There was gay voices, black voices, Latino voices, and on and on. But that also led to uh, a lesson. And the lesson is that all these big media companies, the way they can scale is by, sh uh, by having a common platform. And that common platform allows for scalability, but it also creates constraints. And so the way I, th I think about those constraints is that, um, well, first of all, the, 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 the biggest channels, the, the, the fastest horses will always get fed first, right? So uh, Latino Voices, we would fight to be the ones to tell certain stories, but if HuffPost politics wanted it, they would get the story, right? So the bigger horse always got fed first. And then because we were on a, a, sh a shared platform, we were unable to innovate for the ways that would make our thing uh, work better. So we were great at being a version of Huffington Post, but we were unable to be our best version. And if you look at all the big, uh, all the Latino versions of, uh, uh, of different uh, major news from NBC, Fox News, and so forth, some, some um, version of this problem has always existed. It's part of the reason why they always seem to hit a, uh, a level, right? They don't seem to get any further from there. So that's the second lesson. <clears throat> Then I went over to Fusion, and Fusion, uh, as you, you may have heard from Borja yesterday, is a mess, and that's unfortunate because um, when it started, it, there was a lot of goodwill. I can't tell you how many people were just calling us to say, oh, we're so excited about what you guys are gonna do, we're so excited about where you're trying to uh, go and who you're hiring. Um, we had a real mandate at first. We were gonna be this young Latino thing at scale that nobody else had, had been able to pull off before, and, um, we were promised that we'd be independent and we'd be able to be original. But this is business. We are in the news business, whether we like it or not. And the, the imperatives of the parent companies, ABC News as much as Univision, little by little started becoming realer. And one of the big things that happened was that the, they had signed a television deal. Essentially, Fusion was a cable news network that was already being paid by cable distributors, and that amount of money was a substantial amount of money, and so we weren't about to now not become, not put TV first, we had to. Uh, the problem is that we would try to argue that the audience is gonna be digital. Young Latinos are digital first, right? But there's no, you cannot make the same amount of money in the digital space as you can make on television. And so our parent companies would consistently make decisions based on where the money was coming from. TV dollars, not digital dimes. The seductive appeal of, of millennials. Everybody wants to be in the millennial space. Fusion did too. We, we had learned that young Latinos were basically, and I think this is gonna come up in Roque's presentation, are uh, uh, react somewhat negatively, it's a strong word, but negatively when you brand everything Latino, 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 right? Because when we think of your own friends and your own circles, it's not, not everybody in your circle is Hispanic. And you wanna be able to share things with them and you want them to feel comfortable in your space as much as you feel comfortable in their space. So we understood that if we created Fusion to be uh, open to everybody, even though we focus on Latinos, we'd eventually be able to pull in some non-Hispanic people. In my opinion, Fusion got greedy, and we decided to then go after the, all the millennials and not become this uh, Hispanic champion, this young uh, Hispanic champion. Um, we ended up growing by acquisition, not by, um, uh, or these parent companies grew by acquisition, and as Borja mentioned yesterday, the private equity companies were looking for an IPO. All this led to a lack of investment in an organic growth. So, what was learned? <clears throat> you have to be true to your value proposition. You have to know who you are. You have to know why you're trying to do something. You have to know why those people you're trying to do it for should keep listening to you. AOL lost its sight of that. You have to be flexible in how you deliver this value. Um, I believe that uh, diversity should exist in every way form, right? From the talent that you have, to the formats that you're presenting in your content or your storytelling in, to the ways you're, you're reaching out to people, to the ways you're monetizing it. I believe that in today's news media environment, you, you have to kind of do all of the above, but you're not doing all of the above for everybody. You're doing all of the above for that one audience, that core audience that you must super serve. You have to become part of their life. And then the third thing learned is that the, the depth of the relationship matters more than the breadth. It's more important to really connect with people and be, again, part of their lives than to try to reach everybody on the planet. Um, and so you need to cultivate that. So where do we go from here? So as I, as I mentioned uh, quickly, uh, we're in the news business eventually, right? That business part is not, um, you can't deny it. And the truth is the opportunity is still knocking. The same as it was five years ago when Fusion was starting, same as it was 10 years ago when uh, AOL Latino and HuffPost and all these things were looking at Hispanic space. 
57 million people are U.S. Hispanic today. It's the second largest Hispanic country in the world is our Hispanic community. 50% um, of them are, lower, are less than 30 years old. It's young, and its birth is, uh, it's being driven by birth. We have a, we're wealthy, $1.5 trillion in buying power and growing. Our GDP is twice that of Mexico. So if you're a business person in, in the news space today, you have to be thinking Hispanic. If you're a business person in the media space, you have to be thinking Hispanic. And finally, we're critical for anybody's success. It's not, uh, uh, shouldn't be lost on anybody that to be successful in this country, you have to connect, for the most part, at scale, you have to connect with millennials. If you want to connect with millennials, you have to talk to Latinos, because depending, if you look at the major markets of the United States, let's use LA as an example, 95% of, of all millennials are Hispanic. If you look at New York, it's about 35%. If you go to Miami, it's about 70%. All the major markets, the markets in this country that define success, particularly when you're thinking about millennial, the Hispanic is, the key, is a key component of that, of, that, of that audience. So the message here is that if, um, as Borja was saying, there is path forward to success in the news business, and it will run through Hispanic. And so you will see people interested in it. You will see people interested in your ideas, in funding your, your, um, your businesses. It's not easy, but it's out there. All right, so now we'll pass it on to, how do I switch it now to the next one? We'll pass it on to Felicitas. Se me olvidó. Si no hay, no hay. It's okay. No, 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 me, no me, siento, me siento mal. No lo tomo por sonido. Pueden ser al final. Vamos a coger dos preguntas para cada speaker y entonces al final, si hay tiempo, cogemos preguntas para los demás. Bye, Felicitas. You're back. <laughs> Gracias. Hola. <risa> bueno, muchas gracias a todos por venir. Eh, mi presentación va a ser en inglés, pero es un placer poder por lo menos saludarlos en, en español. Ok, so, um, what I thought would be interesting to bring today um, is a quick and dirty guide doing user testing. User testing that anyone can do and that can significantly improve uh, the quality of the design of any digital product that you're working on. Hence, the Cliff Note reference. So, I'm gonna start with maybe um, a bunch of you don't even know what I'm talking about. So, what is user testing to begin with? Basically, user testing is just uh, the practice of observing people actually use your designs. And the goal of user testing is just to figure out if your designs work if people can actually get things done on whatever digital platform you're working on. Design has to be uh, you know, visually interesting, but it also has to work. Things seem to be easy to use. And user testing will give you insight into whether you're um, accomplishing this or not. <laughs> so m maybe now you're wondering, well, why should I care? Like user testing sounds like something very technical. Uh, should like designers be doing that? Uh, what does that have to do with my work if I'm a reporter? Well, I would say I'm making uh, two assumptions about uh, the audience here today. Uh, the first is that all of you are very invested in, um, in making sure that the digital uh, platform in which your stories are delivered to the audience is as best as possible. Maybe you run your own website, maybe you're a data journalist and you do a little bit of front-end design and make interactives. Maybe you yourself don't do any, uh, any design or development directly, but you work closely with the designers and developers when it comes to figuring out uh, you know, what the digital delivery of whatever story you're making is going to be. So you want to make sure that uh, the design and the delivery of uh, your stories is 
at the very least, not a barrier for users, right? So that people can actually like read and use the things that you're making. And maybe, you know, if you're more ambitious, you also want to innovate in your storytelling. So user testing is going to help you with both of these. Um, the second assumption I'm making is that no one here has time or resources to add another task uh, to your to-do list of uh, all the stuff you're working on every day, right? So uh, what I'm going to uh, explain today or present today is a method for user testing that is very its easy. Anyone can do it. It's low cost. It will take not a lot of your time. And it will, um, I can guarantee that it's going to deliver really interesting, uh, actionable insights and will help you improve whatever it is that you're designing or helping design. Um, and I say we can, I can guarantee it because we do this at Quartz a lot. And it really, really works. Oh, sorry, I didn't introduce myself, so <laughs> I just realized. Um, so I'm Felicita Sanchez. Um, my official uh, role is user advocate at Quartz, which just means that I do uh, user research for the uh, digital product team at Quartz. I'm so sorry about that. This is why I'm talking about this, not some random person. Cool, so. So I've convinced you, you're like, yes, I'm going to do some user testing. How are we going to do user testing? So the technique that I wanted to talk about is to call thinking aloud. It's the method in user research. Um, to do a think aloud, uh, all you have to do is recruit a group of representative users. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later. Um, it's very important that this group of users that you recruit is actually, actually mirrors uh, who your readers are. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more afterwards, but um, sorry. So you recruit a group of users, and you have to give them a typical task to perform on your uh, platform. The, making it task-driven is key. It's super important. You have to tell them like, to do something. It's not just like, oh, check this out. What do you think? Ask them to do something specifically that you would be expecting any user to actually try to do on this thing that you're designing. Um, and while and ask them that as they try to perform this task, they just uh, sp uh, think aloud so that they say anything that crosses their mind while they're trying to use this. So you have them do this task, think aloud, and you, are, um, you have to be there with them or you have to be, it can, done, it can be done online on some video conference platform too. And you just take notes. You watch them and you take notes and you listen. Right, so imagine, uh, just to make this a little bit more clear, imagine you've like designed a data visualization tool that allows people to input a zip code and see how zoning regulations have changed in an area, right? So you would gather these users and individually you would ask them, figure out how uh, your neighborhood has changed, uh, how zoning has changed in your neighborhood, for example. So that would be a typical task that you would want them to do. And while you're doing it, whatever crosses your mind, just say it. And if they fall silent, probe them. You, you know, what are you thinking? Um, and you just listen, you take notes, and you observe. So what should you be uh, looking for while you're looking at your users? Um, so the first thing is behavior. Are they scrolling, swiping when they have to swipe? Uh, you know, are, are, they, are they reaching? Are they, they, can they find the, uh, the input form that they have to complete? Right? So it's the way they're moving on your platform. Um, then it's also, you know, what are they thinking as they do this? Do they express frustration? Are they like, hmm, I think I need to go here, but I'm not sure. Um, so are they confused? Are they ever lost? Are they ever like, what is this? Why is this scrolling? Why is this swiping? Why is this moving? I promise you will see it. We hear that a lot. Um, and finally, you also have to be, um, uh, pay attention to um, body language. Right, but sometimes people are maybe not entirely aware or don't like say what is your feeling. But if you see, the, like frustration is visible, you can see it in somebody's face even if they don't say it. Or even like the good things, like if people are like, "Ooh, surprised," but in a good way, that's a really good observation. If they're surprised and like, "What, what, what is this?" you know you have a problem. Well, and as, you, um, as you're observing people, you need to be collecting some data. Some typical things that are going to be very useful, measure the success rate. So you gave them a, a task to perform. How many people actually managed to perform this task? Uh, 
be, uh, pay attention to um, distinguishing between people who manage to perform the task seamlessly and people who struggle a little bit and even finish. Because during a test, people will struggle and will try their best to do what you ask them to do. But when the user is in the wild, they will not, definitely. Um, measure time to complete it. Something takes forever. It's obviously, you know, you can maybe improve that. And be sure to take uh, notes of actual quotes and to capture like how people are actually, uh, what people are actually saying and how they're reacting to your design. Um, an example I, would, I wanted to share, so at Quartz, maybe I don't know if anyone here is familiar with our app, but we have this uh, news app that delivers the news in like a conversational UI. And a few months ago, we added an AR feature to it. So for example, if we're reporting on a story about a Tesla car, we might add an AR 3D model to the conversation that you can tap into um, and then see it in like 3D on your phone. Sorry if this is a bit, if you've never seen it, it might sound kind of weird. So we did some, we were like, we're worried, you know, is this, um, ooh, um, people are not very familiar with AR and uh, this is gonna be hard for the design, so we decided to test it. And one of the things that we found, it was very interesting, so people would, um, say, you know, people had their phone, they were like, I was, give them a task, check out the AR model that we added. They'll be like, okay, oh, this is cool. You know, they tapped into it. And then the first instruction that we gave them was uh, point the camera at a flat surface because we need, AR models need to be anchored on something. So it has to be a flat surface. So we needed people to do like this, right? To just aim it at like a table or something. And when we did testing, we found that everybody read that and then did this. Right? So they were aiming their phone to a flat surface. It totally makes sense, but we were not expecting that reaction. And the thing is, if you do this and then you place the object, like on your phone, you see it from here, then the car gets played in this really weird perspective. So people were like, okay, there it is. And then they were like, okay, I can see it. I can I do this. And then they were like, what is that? Because like the bird's view of a car is very weird. Like, is this, I, you, know, was, you know, and it was such a, you realize, okay, we have a problem here clearly. And it was just a very easy to solve problem. We just needed to change the language we were using to explain what people needed to do. Um, but if we would have launched with this, it would it may totally ruin the experience. So that's an example of uh, how user testing works. So you're like, okay, yes, I definitely need to do user testing. This sounds very hard though, like do I need to do it with like thousands of people? What is like statistically significant? The magic of user testing is that an industry standard for how much, you, uh, how much people you need to test with is only five, oh sorry, I'm done. I'm sorry, it's only five people. Um, I can answer questions about this afterwards. You need, just need to find five people that are representative users. A test can take 10 to 20 minutes. So we're talking about like, you know, an hour, two hours of your time. This will give you amazing insight and things that you can actually uh, use with design. And I ran out of time, so I'm not gonna talk about that. But uh, so the things that you're going to find are, you know, what works, uh, what doesn't, what, what doesn't work, and you absolutely need to fix. It's the first thing you're going to like use. But it will also like if you do this, uh, you know, often you're going to get like very good at predicting how your users use things. Like you're going to acquire a sensibility of us uh, towards users, and you're going to apply that in future design. And it also will allow you to uh, explore more and like uh, do like things that aren't the typical thing because you know you can test them and then uh, decide if you're going to use it or not. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> I ran through the end. Questions? Any questions? You said you were gonna say more about how you choose this group of users. Yes. Maybe you should Okay, so now would be that. a good approach. Si, exactly. <laughs> um, yes, so what's important, so you need five, you, five or seven users. Just doing it with five or seven users is gonna give you enough insight that it, you, know, you don't need to keep on testing. You can if you want to, but it's like a curve where you're like the return just flatten out. So the your first five users are gonna give you like a pretty good pattern. When choosing your users, make sure to choose people that represent and mirror who your readers generally are, especially in um, regarding to their technological background and expertise. So if you know that a lot of your readers are um, I don't know, people in their 60s who maybe don't use Instagram and uh, don't use Facebook, right? So they have a different way of behaving online. Those are the types of users that you should be picking. Uh, it's important that these five users are also the same type of user. Uh, so don't mix like the millennial Snapchatty person with your grandmother. 
because then your results are just going to be all over the place. You had to have a group of five for each type of user. And like, where do you get them? Like, it can be anywhere. Like, if you work in an office, you probably, I use people from like the marketing team and the business team. Anyone who is not familiar with the design and the information that you're going to put into that design is good enough. Well, I will get the job done. Uh, maybe if you work in a co-working space, people from your co-working space, if there's an office next door, it, you know, try to get people from there. Just uh, friends and family also work. Everybody knows five people. Um, so if, uh, you know, it's, if you do this often, at one point, you're going to run out of people, uh, and then you're going to have to um, look into your actual users, which uh, I'm not going to talk about. But uh, to begin with, friends and family, coworkers are great. Sorry. Is it okay to use the same people again and again? It is, as long as the people aren't like familiar. If it's like a, a th if you're retrying the same design, then you should obviously not try to use it. Try not use. Yeah, exactly. If you're iterating, you need to change people. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it's it's okay. Hola. Buenas tardes. ¿Estamos? Uy, demasiadas cosas en las manos. Muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Luisa Ortiz, pero me dicen Lu. En Estados Unidos a la gente le gusta hacer todo cortito, aunque mi nombre es corto, pero Lu es Lu. Y hoy vengo a hablarles de una experiencia súper, súper bonita y edificante que mi colega Estrella Soria y yo desarrollamos eh, este... Este pasado, este pasado invierno. De hecho, les voy a tomar una foto y les voy a decir por qué. Porque Estrella no viaja a los Estados Unidos y no les voy a decir por qué, pero tiene que ver con un señor de pelo naranja. Y entonces, quiero que por favor saluden a Estrella, digan hola Estrella, una, dos, tres, hola. La extraño muchísimo. Nunca hemos dado esta presentación juntas. Somos una equipa de investigación Que, que nos vemos todos los días en este Jitsi, pero que nunca trabajamos juntas. Entonces, realmente una colaboración súper linda. Eh, hicimos un estudio longitudinal, transregional, pentaglobal, histriónico, eh, durante el invierno, haciéndonos una pregunta y una pregunta solamente. Y la pregunta era, ¿cómo…? Somos postmarxistas, no podemos evitarlo. Pero la pregunta era, ¿cómo experimentamos la violencia de género en línea? Las periodistas, las reporteras ciudadanas, las activistas de género, las defensoras de los derechos de la tierra y o talleristas, educadoras, etcétera, etcétera, etcétera. Y esa pregunta muy cargada sobre el hecho de violencia de género en línea. No me van a escuchar decir dos cosas y me encanta canalizar el espíritu de María Hinojosa, es decir, nosotros no hablamos de víctimas, adiós con eso de las víctimas, y no hablamos de sobrevivientes, adiós con eso de las sobrevivientes, hablamos de personas que se enfrentan, que pelean, luchan, y le rompen la madre a las violencias de género en línea. P punto. Yes. Al formularnos las preguntas, y después si quieren preguntarnos sobre la gráfica que es súper bonita, Todo, todo tiene una razón de ser, pero nos formulamos esta pregunta y encontramos una narrativa. Y es una narrativa, es una línea, es un arco lineal que se repite en los 23 países. No pudimos hablar con gente de Uruguay, no hablamos con gente del Perú ni con gente del Salvador por una cuestión solamente de organización de nuestro tiempo, no se pudo. Pero a lo largo de las 23 entrevistas diseñadas con metodología de design thinking, muy profundas, basadas en la empatía, encontramos cinco momentos En, el lo, en la loca montaña rusa de la violencia de género en línea. Puede parecer contraintuitivo, pero no lo es. Cuando inicia la violencia de género en línea, no nos damos cuenta que está comenzando. De la misma manera como la violencia doméstica, tú no te das cuenta y no puedes recordar el momento en el que se empezó a pasar de lanza, porque no sabes cua, por qué lo dejaste llegar tan lejos. O sea, el bofetón no es el inicio de la violencia doméstica. Lo mismo sucede con la violencia de género en línea. Cuando las mujeres piden ayuda, la marea está, o sea, estas películas de armagedones donde está ella mirando el fin del mundo con la, el tsunami enfrente, en ese momento es cuando pedimos ayuda. Creo que me siento un poco mal. Hay algunos bots que están en mi cuenta de Twitter. 
cuando la mujer pide ayuda, hay muy poco que hacer. Por favor, no me citen, pero revertir los efectos de la violencia de género en línea es virtualmente imposible y todas lo sabemos. Por eso hay que combatirla, prevenirla y preparar los golpes de karate. Cuando implementamos los, los ajustes, cuando implementamos las soluciones, las soluciones que se implementan en muchos casos son para mitigar. Todavía Mark Zuckerberg no me contesta el teléfono. Cuando le digo, oye Mark, ¿sabes qué? Se están pasando de lanza con Lidia Cacho. Mark no hace un carajo. Entonces, o sea, a mí que me digan si vamos a implementar estrategias para aliviar a Facebook. Dejen eso de lado. Las soluciones entonces tienen que ver con la comunidad. Las soluciones tienen que ver con los marcos legales y políticos y sociales en donde nos encontramos. Las soluciones tienen que ver con las hermanas, con los hermanos, con los aliados, con las aliadas, con les aliades. Y las consecuencias de los efectos duran para toda la vida. Es a, deep, it's a big deal. Estamos lidiando con algo bastante heavy. Y aquí se los dejo, definición estándar, eh, una combinación entre Naciones Unidas, UNIFEM y lo que nosotras hemos encontrado. Y sobre todo quiero poner el énfasis en un punto en particular y es la violencia de género en línea le sucede a las personas que se identifican como mujeres por el hecho de ser mujeres, punto, y porque están en línea, punto. Oye, pero es periodista, es un calificativo y además es indígena o además es negra y además es feminista, aumentan los calificativos. The black, the black slide. Es importante. La cuerpa eh, es la combinación de mi corporalidad online y mi corporeidad offline. Cuando tú me agredes en línea, me estás agrediendo sexualmente. Cuando tú me deseas lo peor en un comentario, en una historia que yo escribí con mi byline, me estás agrediendo sexualmente. ¿Ok? Ok. ¿Qué fue lo que aprendimos? Y me voy súper rápido. Y esto es el resultado súper condensado de este estudio que hicimos. Primer lugar. Las mujeres periodistas pensamos que es parte de nuestro trabajo y que nos lo merecemos. Ay, pero pues si así es él. Ay, mi editor, ay, le encanta agarrarme las piernas, pero chido, es súper buena onda, ¿eh? me apoya muchísimo. Mira, nomás me tomo unos tragos con él, ya cuando está borrachito lo encamino para su cuarto y ya me voy. It's not part of our job, I'm sorry, it's not. Cuando hablamos de violencia es demasiado tarde. Ya la cosa es, y, y muy tristemente tampoco podemos decir, ¿por qué no denunciaste antes? La gente le toma su tiempo, no es simple y no es sencillo, porque además en un porcentaje alarmante, el perpetrador es alguien que conoces, una persona con la que probablemente tienes una revolución, una revolución, una relación emocional, directa, es tu pareja, es tu compañero de trabajo, es la persona que maneja el carro en el que tú vas. La contención es lo primero que llega, cuando hablamos de contención estoy hablando de contención emocional. Entre nosotras, los círculos de sororidad no han llegado todavía al newsroom. Y si, no, y si ya están en el newsroom, todavía no aparecen abiertamente. La contención es la escucha activa. Es la colega que te dice, pues qué andas rara, qué pasó, cómo te sientes, por qué no hablamos. Tengo una perspectiva muy particular con respecto a hacerlo, hacerlo con tragos utilizar drogas recreativas o dedicarnos a bajarle la, la tensión al momento con alcohol, cigarros, etc. Tengo la impresión de que estamos eh, poniendo mucho peso en este mito de que en el periodismo bebemos como cosacos y así nos bajamos el estrés. Yo creo, quiero dejarlo ahí nada más. La contención no necesariamente tiene que ver con una botella de vino. Lo dejo sobre la mesa. Pero la contención es informal es ad hoc, es voluntaria, nadie le da seguimiento y entonces te quedas como en el aire, en el limbo, ay pues, ¿será que me recomiendan a un abogado, a una terapeuta? ¿O será que le digo a mi jefe o hablo con recursos humanos? Nunca, es, nunca está hecho, nunca está formalizado. Pero los círculos de apoyo son reales y somos manada, y eso se los digo muy claramente. Estamos 
todas con los ojos abiertos. Todas, todos y todes. Y cuando ya lo viste, you cannot unsee it. Entonces les dejo para terminar unas recomendaciones. Si tú lo ves, tienes que hablar. Si tú lo ves, tienes que decirlo. Le dijo feo, siempre la manda por los cafés, o lo manda por los cafés, oiga. Siempre hacen esa bromita chistosa, ¿no? De la persona y de su identidad de género, y ni siquiera hemos llegado allá. La agarra, la, la, la abraza, ay, véngase, yo le doy su abracito. Si tú lo ves, debes hablar. Documenten todo, salud. Documenten todo, correos electrónicos, pantallazos, imágenes, documenten, porque eso puede servir. Eso le puede salvar la vida a una compañera en una discusión o en una pelea con recursos humanos, una conversación con Human, con este, human Resources. No tiene que ser he said, she said. Busquen aliados, aliades, aliadas. Nunca vayan solas, nunca vayan solos a confrontar. Y te, intentemos cambiar la cultura del espacio en el que estamos. Esto ya no puede seguir así. Creo que les agradezco, esta soy yo. Hay una liguita, esta información está open source, la pueden descargar. Yo tengo una. Eh, ustedes además de, de, ustedes hacen talleres con mujeres en comunidades. Quería que nos contaras un poco qué, qué es ese, ese training o no sé, esas conversaciones que tienen. Acabamos de tener un taller allá arriba. No sé si alguna de las compañeras quiere pues, hacer un resumen muy corto de lo que hicimos acá arriba hace unos minutos. Coco. ¿Cómo te fue? ¿Cómo estuvo? ¿Cómo estuvo Pero el no, taller? Estuve en, estuve en la mitad. Pero, no, ¿cómo, no, estuvo, ¿cómo lo sentiste? Eh, fue un espacio donde sacamos todo, <ríe> lo bueno, lo malo. Y... Eh, no sé, podemos conseguir ideas, apoyo, apapacho, como dijiste. Necesita, a veces necesitas un, un abrazo. Eh, y es bueno para seguir adelante o, o no sé, para ver qué, cómo vamos a seguir mañana. Los, la creación de espacios seguros, safe spaces, no es, no es una cosa así como una verdad de perogrullo. Crear espacios seguros significa que hay lugares donde podemos comenzar la conversación y hemos comenzado a hablar también de la posibilidad de tener espacios seguros para mujeres y espacios seguros para, seguros para hombres, para que ustedes también puedan hacer preguntas. Sabemos que tienen miles de preguntas. We're trying to get to the point where we can talk to you guys without getting angry. Ténganos paciencia, ahí vamos. Ahí vamos. Pero todavía estamos un poco tensas. Eh, gracias, Lu. Eh, no me queda muy claro cuáles son los mecanismos para identificar, si puedes dar un poquito de, como de claves, cómo se representa esta violencia de género online, como con puntos concretos y ejemplos concretos, digamos, porque dices que como que empezó la conversación, como que ya es muy tarde, pero, pero cuando sabes, si puedes dar como ejemplos de cómo una mujer puede darse cuenta que esto está pasando y cuándo, y con un ejemplo concreto, cuándo es eso demasiado tarde, porque una cosa es que me hackeé en la cuenta de Twitter, pero... Eh, ¿Qué significa la violencia de género en línea exactamente? Gracias. Te puedo responder desde dos perspectivas. Eh, estamos en confianza, ¿no? Este, tú lo sientes. Es una cuestión muy extraña, pero cuando hay violencia de género, una misma lo siente. Puedes, puede venir desde una perspectiva, reacciona a un comentario, a una cita, a una, a una nota que tú publicaste. Viene un comentario muy claro en la parte de abajo que dice algo. El comentario está hipersexualizado generalmente. Pide tu atención sin que tú lo desees. Te descalifica o te desea maldades. Eso es una, un, un punto. Lo otro puede ser la difusión de materiales sin tu consentimiento. Fotografías, ideas, imágenes... Y esto es en todos los medios posibles, puede ser desde WhatsApp hasta Instagram, eh, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, o inclusive en Slack, o en los canales internos de la oficina, también sucede. Una tercera cosa es impersonation, cuando alguien se hace pasar por ti. Ay, recibí un texto tuyo, no, no fui yo. Y esto puede pasar 
a otros niveles, pero las tres, digamos que las tres primeras cosas que tú puedes ver, sexual, hipersexualización, comentarios no deseados o difusión de mi material. Y en ese momento es cuando una debería de prender las alarmas y es cuando generalmente apagas el celular, te tomas una copa de vino y dices, no, esto ya va a pasar. En ese momento es donde hay que actuar, ahí, hay que agarrarlo ahí. Después les cuento qué se puede hacer para desmontarlo. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Roque Planas, I'm a national reporter over at the Huffington Post. I apologize for my much more primitive PowerPoint presentation. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is sort of hints at some things that Miguel had said earlier, but from the editorial perspective rather than the business perspective. Um, I was asked to answer this question here, uh, what stories, issues, and impact could newsrooms pursue if their ranks were more inclusive of Latino reporters and how far away are we? So a couple caveats before we start. Uh, I'm talking about online and print national uh, uh, media outlets and only referring to the specific coverage of the Latino community. Uh, so I started as a staff reporter uh, in about 2011, uh, working with some of these English language Latino media outlets that cropped up to serve specifically uh, younger Latinos who are getting their news primarily in English. Uh, this, this sort of cropped up after the 2010 census with the idea being that uh, these companies wanted to get a piece of this $1 trillion Latino market, right? Uh, Voxy, NBC Latino, Fox News Latino, HuffPost Latino Voices, these were all elements of that. I worked at the last uh, two. So fast forward to present day, uh, and basically these are all dead. Uh, but we did learn a few things. Uh, in trying this experiment, and I think some of them are applicable to trying to understand what we're missing and who's missing from the picture. Uh, so, first of all, first question, what stories could we be chasing harder? I went too fast, but this is my answer. It's to start with, I don't know, right? And I say that not as a cop-out, but as just a way to sort of get us to think about how you should start from a point of humility, right? Um, You know, I think when we talk about diversity, or at least in my conversations in NAHJ and my newsroom the last few years, there's always this sort of, I think the first place that we go is that, you know, this is an injustice, right? The lack of Latinos in the newsroom is a manifestation of racism that needs to be addressed. The second place is the business argument that Miguel referred to. But I think that there's also sort of a more a deeper issue that we can think about, which is just when you have people that are walking around with important knowledge and they're excluded from the newsroom, right? That's a void that's created there that we all lose as readers, as reporters, and as the general public, right? Uh, so I don't pretend to know what someone could teach me before I learn it, right? I just know that I want to learn. Uh, and so I say, especially after 2016, it's very important for us never to underestimate the depth uh, of our own ignorance, right? But I did spend a lot of time working on this issue and honing in on covering the Latino community, right? And here's a few principles that I think that we all learn in the process of doing that. Number one, uh, well, backing up. If you're going to cover, if you're going to create an outlet just for Latino news, it then follows, you know, what's a Latino story? Uh, there is such a thing as a Latino story, but I think that there are very few and far between ones that can sort of unify all of us. I think what we learned was that really what you want to go for is hyper specificity. We're not one community, we are thousands of communities with a sort of uh, base level of points upon which we touch, right? Um, so here's a Latino story. Who remembers this one? Anyone know this one? This was, this was not mine, this was not even HuffPost, this is a, a BuzzFeed story, basically about this guy who was applying for jobs. His name was Jose, he wasn't getting any callbacks, and then so he strikes the S from his name all of a sudden he starts getting callbacks when he's applying as Joe. It was very clever, 
It went super viral. It definitely hit a broad swath of the Latino community. It brought people together. But this is the exception. Uh, attempt this at your peril, because it's very hard to replicate. Uh, we went back a few years ago at HuffPost and did a big drill down on our analytics, right? And we wanted to see uh, what keywords in the headlines made a story sink or swim. What are the issues that people care about? What's flopping? Number one word, guaranteed that your story would die on the branch, Latino. If you put the word Latino in there, the story was basically guaranteed to fail, which gives something of an inkling as to why these uh, efforts to create Latino news uh, were unsuccessful, right? Because uh, they very self-consciously branded as Latino. You may violate this rule if your name is Maria Hinojosa and you ran Latino USA before, during, and after all this, but pretty much everyone else approach with caution because it doesn't tend to work. What does work is specificity, right? Uh, there are many examples that one could go through. The one that I wanted to highlight, because it was one that was important to me personally, and I think really emblematic of this, was our coverage of the uh, banning of Mexican-American studies in Texas. Uh, I was first sent to Arizona by Alberto over there. Thank you. Um, and in the years since, I think over about six years, maybe filed about six dozen clips of various aspects of this. Every single one was guaranteed to burn on social I knew it, I didn't care if they put it on the front page, I didn't care if they promoted it, it was nice if they did, right? But you knew that this was gonna work because people were finding it and sharing it and you could see how it was cutting across. It was, not a, it was a Mexican American story about a specific school district in one city, but it came to be one that sort of uh, uh, hit on a universal theme, right? All right, este, so through specificity, transcendence. So then it follows, who's missing, right? And this is where I think that we have what I call the diversity problem within the diversity problem, right? I worked on these projects, two different projects, five years or so of my life, about 15 or 16 colleagues in that time, only one was Mexican American. Uh, that is a glaring omission, and if you were to look across the national news media, you would find similar biases. You would find that the Latino reporters that we do have, which are already not enough, right, tend to be lighter skin, tend to be Caribbean background, tend to be overrepresented from South America and underrepresented from uh, Mexican backgrounds, Afro-Latinos uh, and Latinas virtually invisible, right? And so, because of those biases, what's missing, right? And I could mention a lot of things. I think gentrification, for example, where I live now in East Austin is a huge issue and I think increasingly should be considered uh, a national issue that more reporters should cover as a national beat. Our tortured discussion about race could benefit from a lot more people like the thoughtful people that we had on the earlier panel about identity. Um, but if I was gonna pick one that I think is super important, it would be this one of the Latino vote, okay? The Latino vote story is one that I feel is consistently butchered in the national media because it is almost always framed around this notion of civic failure on the part of Latinos, right? And the underlying assumption there is that Latinos are dumb, are lazy, or don't understand their own interest, right? But if you stop and think about, or let me back up, do people stop and think about whether there are real reasons that might account for this that don't, uh, that don't stem from that kind of assumption, right? Uh, I can tell you, let's start with mixed status families. I'm running out of time, but I'm trying to go through fast. Let's start with mixed status families. 57 million Latinos in this country, 8 million undocumented, right? You do the math. It's easy to get confused about what that might mean for civic engagement and the sense of entitlement that you need to act politically because the people that are in the media are the ones who have this massive sense of courage, right? But if you think about it, a lot of people, and if you talk to people, you will commonly find that the message that they receive at home is quite the opposite. Don't stick your neck out, don't get in trouble, right? Because that's the formula that allows people to survive. What does that do to your sense of civic engagement and your sense 
of entitlement, right? We can think about institutions. If you live in a Latino area of town or neighborhood in a place like Texas, especially if we're talking about South Texas, you live in an area that is probably over-policed. You live in an area where you're probably getting stopped for silly reasons, right? What does that do to your sense of faith in the institutions of your local government, right? Maybe you don't want to go to the local government when you have a problem. Maybe you might go to somewhere you trust, like the church. Maybe if you don't have health insurance because they don't want to sign on to Obamacare in Texas, you don't necessarily think, oh, I'm going to start an NGO and go pressure the legislature to fix this. You might turn to a mutual aid society, right? So uh, I know I'm running out of time, so I would just say that there's got, I know, maybe yeah, one day I want to do this story, right? But I know that there are people out there that have much more qualification to do it that are already thinking about hitting any number of these issues, right? And that they could do it better than me. I hope to see it. I hope to learn more about what I don't know. Thank you, and any questions? Uh, I was fascinated by this, um, this, this, this idea that including Latino in a headline ensured that the, that the story would fail. Are, is that um, in like mainstream publications or even, sorry? Uh, a half post. Oh, okay, got it. So, and so I mean, was that, what's the idea behind that? Is that, is that half posts sort of readership tends to be white and therefore not care about Latino stories? I mean, was there a sense of whether it would be different if you're talking about stories that were published in predominantly Latino outlets? Or maybe in that case, you wouldn't even need to include the word Latino in a, in a headline. I don't know, like what some of the thinking there. The conclusion that we came to is that it's just not a way that people identify. And the Pew research backs this up, right? Like people would identify primarily by country of uh, heritage um, or maybe, maybe some sort of regionalism. But to think about, like Latino is an idea that's being created. And it's being created in some ways for like political purposes that have nothing to do with people's lives. It's being created by companies who want to make money in a way that has nothing to do with people's lives, right? So. For me, what made more sense editorially, right? And I think one of the ways that we messed up, and Miguel was hinting at this, right, is that it made more sense to just get really specific about a more uh, individual issue affecting one community, but then you had to go deep, right? And so, whoops. And so if you didn't do that, if it was superficial, you were still sort of turning people away. But I think trying to speak to the Latino community as a Latino community, like we're not quite there yet. Can I follow up on, over here, Roque? Right here? Yeah. Great presentation. So uh, following up on that question, Latino as a generic, I guess, in the headline, but what if we, because you're talking about the Mexican-American, you know, the, the, um, the book issue and the education issue. What if you're more specific? If you say Puerto Rican, Mexican-American, does that draw people? Yes, totally. So like Puerto Rican so statehood, the, more specific, the dead the stuff, better. that yeah, all works. <clears throat> all right, thank you. Or work based on the data that we had, yeah. Uh, I have one. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Was that we find that Oh, that was internal. Um, you, didn't, you didn't hear this from me. <laughs> <laughs> So you never pitch a story uh, as a Latino story either to your editors? I wouldn't. I mean, but there's definitely still people who do it. Um, you know, I mean, I think especially as we start getting into electoral season and like you're going to see people running for office as that Latino guy, um, people will start looking. I mean, and I think over time, I do think that we will start to think of ourselves as Latinos, you know, like that will be a thing. Um, but right now, you know, I, I, I think, say for example, this whole phenomenon of like uh, Julian Castro, maybe he runs, maybe he doesn't. That's going to be a political story more than it's going to be a Latino story, right? Like I don't think like Tejanos wake up and they're like, Julian Castro, you know what I mean? Like it's much more of a like, uh, can he combat Donald Trump kind of thing, you know, that like DC insiders care about more than the Latino public. Thank you.
There's an expletive in my uh, deck. <laughs> my name is Romina Ruiz Guerriana, and I love being in places where I can say that without <laughs> having to Romina, you know. <laughs> so I've been asked to speak about innovation. And um, I've been doing this for a little bit. I look great, but I've been doing this for a little bit. And basically, every time, hands down, a journalist sees this, they freak out. They're like, what am I doing? We've been talking about this forever. I mean, I'm breaking news, and I'm grinding out there, and I'm pursuing leads, and now they want me to innovate. Like, what does that even mean? The world is dominated by two platform companies, Google and Facebook. And if I'm not creating the Airbnb of journalism, then I am failing and without a job. Um, that might not completely be true. I will be honest with you. There are people in a VR lab in Latin America, in India, in the US, creating the next platform for journalism. You should befriend them for one reason and on only, which is regardless of who they are, they need content, and if you're in this room, you are the people who know how to tell stories. And without that, every single platform, whether it's Uber Eats or Facebook, is reduced to ashes, a little bit like eBay right now. So who am I? Um, as I said, I gave you my name, but I am a journalist that started as a new media assistant when that was a thing, you know, before digital, and I would moderate comments in Israel's Haaretz.com. So I started my career in the Middle East and then progressively made my way back. And, you know, we've been in crisis ever since I've been a journalist. And so um, I was very fortunate to, you know, work at the tail end of, like, the print wonderful life and then learn judgment from those wonderful people, but then worked my way in different areas of production. I was a foreign correspondent all over the Americas. I worked for Televisa, for CNN, for the Associated Press. And I realized, because I always had my, you know, I always liked like the product team or like the people innovating, that every time I would sit in one of those big editorial meetings, it was gonna take another 20 years before I could make a decision. So like, it wasn't about me coming to the table and it was a very white male table, I will say. So I went to Home Depot and I bought some plywood and I decided to build a table. And um, in 2016, in an election year, um, my co-founders who were Mexican millennials, who are still Mexican millennials, um, they were like, we wanna do a thing for Latinos. And I was like, you're fucking crazy. <laughs> because of all the reasons we already heard. Um, CNN, Latino, everyone has failed. Like, why do you think we should do this? And it was an election year. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm going to speed up. But basically, the idea we, w we had, my terms of reference for doing this was a white sheet of paper. They were like, build it. If you can believe it, you can build it, which was insane. And they said, here's $100,000, which feels like a lot of money. But when you see legacy media, you know that it isn't. And we said the belief was, as you heard today, that if we could dissect the pie and create different verticals for different users, for different audience groups across different things, across platforms, we could do it. And you would build it socially, you would push it out and never build a website until you knew what you were doing. We called this smart content. Seems real smart. And in three years, we had 11 million users between Mexico and the US. Um, and it seems great. Easy, right? Wrong. So we pushed out, you know, I had this thing, there's two men who you saw, whom you saw, and they were my advisors in all of this process. The US outlet we're gonna talk about is Barrio. Um, you know, I've covered Central American war, you know, like Central, excuse me, not war, Central American migration and drug war and blah, blah, blah. So I know what the Latino, I'm Latina, I know what the community wants. And then March 31st happened. And um, as you can see from the numbers, I was failing miserably, which was a huge ego blow because I'm supposed to understand my own community, what is going on. There were retirement communities with more engagement than me at the time, like the, a like the AARP was killing it and I couldn't figure out why. So what did we do? Thank God we had a product team, user research, which we hadn't done. You know, we launched with my hypothesis. 
and we started doing A-B testing of all kinds of content, went back to the drawing board, and then this happened. We put up this meme, by the way, we did it with $10, so you can do this without asking for $100,000 with a Canvas subscription. Um, we put out this, it was JJ Watt, my son would be very proud that I said that correctly, um, and he said, La amo y la aprecio, viva la México. And, it, be, and it, was a vi it became a viral thing. Overnight, Barrio, which had like 60 people following it, we got 452 likes. We had put $2 to test this. We did this over and over, and we're like, wait, are we onto something? What's going on? So what we learned in doing this, it wasn't that Latinos didn't care about racism because our voice when we started was like incredibly, it was ironic and sardonic. It wasn't that they didn't know about racism or they didn't care about racism. It was like, pendeja, we already know about this. Like we deal with this all day, every day, all the time. We need you to inform us. You, I, we need you to talk to us, not talk down to us. So then, you know, what do you do? You pivot. And we created these things called insights, which we derived, and we understood that credibility, pride, sense of belonging, optimism, and humor and audacity were instrumental. If every story had at least two of these, it would perform really well. I'm gonna, so then, if nothing else, I'm gonna teach you, there are three things that I wanted to leave you with. I can't see the time, okay. Number one, what did I do wrong and why did it take me six months to figure this out when it should have taken me three weeks, right? Fall in love with the problem, not your solution. What does this mean? You know, Yuri Levine, the co-founder of Waze, says this all the time. It means if I'm trying to tell stories for the Latino community, that is my problem. I should, I should be agnostic as to how I solve it. It also means you're, not, you're, going, you're never gonna run out of possible solutions because you're gonna be trying different formats, you're gonna be trying different platforms, you're gonna be trying different revenue streams, you're constantly going to be innovating because you're, you're serving something that is bigger, that is not one function. The second thing, trust your audience, and I can't say this enough, you know, learn how to read analytics and run user programs, um, user experience, why, you know, a part of our, two million of our, of our users were, uh, were undocumented. And what we learned, we did this pilot with a B corporation that used to do data. And what we learned by doing that pilot was um, we wanted to, you know, we wanted to, ha we wanted to grow in numbers and we didn't want to invest in Facebook. But, they had a service where with SMS they would reach and do polling. Now, why was it brilliant? Because the way in which they got these users is that they had a delegate from this platform in every single Mexican consulate in the United States, then El Salvador and whatnot. It meant that they met face to face with Mexican Americans, that, Mexicans that would leave their phone in a little cubby. They had a captive audience because let me tell you something, if you don't have internet access, or if the only way you do it is on your phone and you have to use Cricket Wireless, you're not gonna take a call from Nielsen Ratings. Like, so understanding where your audience lives and how they live their lives is really important in creating that connection and being able to gather the correct data. Um, and lastly, which is my mantra, which is you can pilot everything, right? You grind, you create, you delete and you repeat, meaning ask the big questions, you can prototype anything, you know, the real moment is when you have like a pipe cleaner and that's like the prototype for your app. Like you can actually find solutions for everything, fail fast, you know, don't be as stubborn as I was um, and be scrappy and try it. At the end of the day, it's really the internet. Um, you can always build, you can always create and if, you know, and if, you know, people say this all the time, and I was part of an accelerator, you know, I had to explain my project to people that were not media people and get those insights and get that feedback for it to be successful. And, you know, in this process and pivoting and failing fast and understanding that, what, we, what I found and what I discovered 
is that, you know, if it's too perfect, you waited too long. The only people that can wait as they want to is the New York Times. So with that, thank you so much. Questions? And you might, hi, my name is Rebecca. Um, you might not have the answer for this, but seeing that it is this, you know, try, fail, repeat, try, fail, repeat, I wonder what your advice would be for someone who is, say, pitching more of Latino content or Mexican content or Jamaican content to a mostly white organization, you know, because it seems like if you're going to fail so much, resources and time are, are scarce. scarce. Okay, so I think that that's two questions in one. Um, I'll say this. I think pitching white men is like a one conversation and failing fast is a different conversation. I think there are things that stick. You know, I'll say this because I did fundraise $2 million, okay? So I'll tell you this. Number one, you got to believe in your product and you got to believe in what you're doing. And you're, you're going to hear a million no's but you have to believe in what you're doing because nobody can do the believing part for you, okay? And you cannot, you know, and, and this is something else, you know, Maria Hinojosa was talking about it today, of, you know, you never know how the funding is gonna come and who's, you know, and a lot of it happens because you know somebody meets somebody, right? Um, I am who I am because of my mentors and because of people that, you know, spent time with me. Um, so I would say you can't make people believe in the people that, are, that you can't convince are not worth your time. Like you need to leave that meeting because f just leave it. Um, and I think um, in this process, what it shows is that you try different things and what doesn't work, you know, you take what works and you leave and discard the rest. Does that make sense? So then you build on what is working. And um, you start talking to people. So there are all kinds of um, entrepreneurs and venture capitalists and stuff that are interested in, I would say this, like if I had to fundraise again, I would focus on social, you know, social venture capitalists and not typical VC firms. You know, I think like that would be my big thing. Like people that believe in the mission of what you're trying to do as opposed to people that are trying to make a buck. Does 